One of the most common questions about photo scanning is what camera is the best? Can I use my smartphone or should I get a DSLR? In short, all capturing devices have three main properties that influence the photo scanned quality, and that is resolution, spatial fidelity, and access to the raw sensor data. It all boils down to these three properties, so in this tutorial we'll have a look at them. Let's start off with resolution. The common sense tells us that the more pixels have the source photos, the more points there will be after the alignment process. That's practically the first thing that comes to mind, and it's not too far away from the truth. Obviously, the 6 megapixels photos produce way more dense point cloud than the 0.6 megapixel sources. And then, if all other properties are equal, the higher resolution sources produce better meshes after reconstruction, and in turn, it results in crispier textures. And it all sounds good, but only if all other properties except resolution are exactly the same. Then the resolution becomes the only factor influencing the quality of photo scans, and we should obviously aim at getting the device with maximum resolution available, but there is a but. There is one more thing that influences the quality of photo scan data, and it is spatial fidelity, or effective resolution. The filmmaker and pixel pusher Steve Yedlin tells us in his blog that this one number, which is resolution, we believe somehow corresponds to the audience's perceptual experience of sharpness and clarity. But the reality is that there are other attributes in the camera and throughout the image chain that all play a role – sensor noise, film grain, halation, edge contrast, you name it. In other words, the quality of pixels. Well, if resolution is quantity, then spatial fidelity is quality. The obvious example of pixels that don't have enough quality is the noise, caused by high ISO, for example. The input that has a high entropy, or the high noise-to-signal ratio, produce noisy meshes, no surprise about that. And from this perspective, resolution can be very deceptive. Here are two images for comparison. The left one has lower resolution and higher spatial fidelity, and the right one has higher resolution and lower spatial fidelity. If we zoom in into the right image with the lower spatial fidelity, we will notice that the pixels are pretty much mangled by chromatic aberration and the noise. And I guess some camera shake on top of it. I somewhat exaggerated the effects to demonstrate the concept, but you get the point. And for the sake of comparison, let's zoom in into the lower resolution image on the left, which has a higher overall clarity and we may say quality of pixels. It's so much better. So the main point to drive home is that the quantity isn't enough to describe uh, the overall effective resolution. The spatial fidelity should absolutely be taken into account when talking about uh, capturing devices. So what are the things in capturing devices that affect spatial fidelity? The sensor and the optics mainly the optics, that affect distortion, corner sharpness, vignetting, chromatic aberration and other artifacts that can influence and will influence the quality of pixels. As for the sensor size, the larger sensors, like the full-frame camera sensors, have larger photoreceptors, and it means the higher sensitivity to the light. It's physics. With smaller, less sensitive sensors, sometimes it's necessary to boost the sensitivity artificially via boosting the ISO value, and it degrades the signal by introducing lots and lots of noise. Then on top of it, the overall quality of optics comes into play. Some zoom lenses, especially the kit lenses, can produce a lot of chromatic aberration and other artifacts that degrade the overall quality of pixels. Here you can see that the image is fairly blurry, and that's already a bad thing, and the chromatic aberration takes as much as I don't know, 20 pixels. It's pretty crazy, and it definitely translates into lower quality output, lower quality meshes. And if it isn't bad enough, it translates to the quality of texturing as well. We can say that this looks pretty bad when we can actually register the chromatic aberration in the textures. The same object captured on a device with a sharper optics will look much, much better in any software, be it Meshroom, or meta shape or reality capture. 
So the sensor and the optics quality are the things to watch for when choosing the capturing device and historically it's been easier to find a DSLR with a decent lens than say to obtain the same level of sharpness on mobile and it doesn't have to be expensive. The prime lenses can be very cheap and produce a great quality rendering and the mid-range DSLR cameras can be bought for reasonable money actually. So to sum it up, it's definitely possible to take a decent quality photo scans using a phone camera, especially if there is enough light and if you're using a tripod. But in our opinion, even an inexpensive DSLR, especially with a decent lens, will most likely beat it in terms of the spatial quality. Here you can see the photo taken on a very, very affordable camera. And while we can tell that this is far from being perfect, it's still a little bit clearer and sharper than what my smartphone provided me with. It's just a matter of optics and the sensor size. And the third feature which is super important in choosing the capturing devices is the ability to access the raw data from the sensor. Without having the direct access to this type of data, we are doomed to use uh, the JPEGs processed in a random way in camera. And in turn, this leads to unnecessary suffering. First of all, we'll have to deal with compression, which is a no-go in photo scanning. Any kind of compression, like the JPEG compression, is a degradation of the signal. And it definitely affects the quality of photo scan on all stages, during matching of the points, during reconstruction and during texturing. And on top of that, the random in-camera processing usually mangles the contrast levels by applying some kind of an S-curve. And not only the contrast, but the chromaticity is pretty much mangled as well, like this should be red, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, if the camera device can save the images in the RAW format, which can be processed in the application like uh, Lightroom or Darktable in our case, we'll get the colors which are more or less correct, in the sense that they are close to the colors in the original scene, and in addition to that, we can use the developing capabilities of Darktable or any other so such software for manipulating exposure and white balance in post. And that is a good news for photogrammetry. So having the access to the sensor data, which is usually provided in the form of the RAW files, is a must-have. Actually, we will talk about color management later in the course as well. So to sum it up, we should really care about three main things, which are resolution, spatial fidelity, and the access to the raw sensor data. These are the three things to watch for in choosing the capturing device, be it a DSLR, a smartphone camera, a camera that is mounted on a drone, whatever it is. In my opinion, the most cost-effective option is to get a prosumer-grade DSLR or the mid-range DSLR. It can be pretty affordable, especially if bought used, and especially if you don't need its video capabilities. That being said, a decent quality photo scans can be taken on a mid-range phone camera as well. It requires carefully choosing uh, the shooting conditions and slightly more work in post-processing, but it's definitely a possibility as well. Actually, the very first example from the practical side of the photogrammetry course was captured on a mobile phone. And if you want to learn more about the course, feel free to find it on Blender Market, Gumroad and Creative Shrimp.